Coming up, we've been talking about this, and we've done it in the past until COVID took it away, but Kairos is a prison ministry. Sean, and waves for everyone who doesn't know Sean, as Sean's been involved in, and uh, we have uh, someone coming here today to share more about that. Pat O'Kelly is going to come forward and talk to you guys about that for a few minutes so we all understand what we're giving to and what it's all about. Come on up, Pat. Good morning. My name's Pat O'Kelly. Um, I've been involved in Cairo since April of 06. How many of you all know what a prison is? How many of you know that there's prisoners in a prison? Play along. It's okay. How many of you know that those prisoners are human beings? How many of you know that God loves them as much as he loves you? I didn't know that until I got there. And most people that are incarcerated, they don't know that either. And that's our job is to go in there and let them know that God loves them and he'll forgive them. Kairos is not a salvation ministry. Kairos is a God loves you and he'll forgive you ministry. Kairos, the weird thing about Kairos is it's interdenominational. I'm Catholic, Sean's Baptist, we have Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Lutheran, the gamut of Christian. As long as you're a Christian, you can be involved in Kairos. The coolest thing about Kairos is that it's interdenominational. To see all these churches get together and share God's love with no bickering, no fighting, just going in as Christians is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. I have a really good friend back home in Cushing that uh, he got involved. He's a Baptist minister, and we were standing outside. We go in for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for four days. We don't spend the night. We spend the days. We're standing outside on Thursday getting ready to go in, and Travis said, this can't work. And I, I kind of laughed. I said, tell me that Sunday night. He said, it can't work. He said, there's very little scripture reading, and it doesn't say anywhere in this manual that God will save you and lead you to heaven. Can't work. I said, again, tell me that Sunday night. On Sunday afternoon, or actually Saturday afternoon, he came up to me bawling his eyes out. And he said, it works. I don't know how, but it works. And I said, because God's in control of it. That's how it works. We go in for four days. There's, uh, there's 42 different inmates each time we go. We go into men's prisons. There's a ladies' prison in McLeod, Oklahoma, that has a ladies' team. If, if, if you ladies are in wanting to get involved, um, this is not just men. Um, there's... There's a series of talks, and there, we set it at little tables. There's seven, or seven tables of nine people. There's three of us and six inmates at each table. And so we have these series of talks, and then they're about a 20-minute talk, and then the residents, inmates, get to talk about what it meant to them. On Friday, there's two separate talks about forgiving yourself, which is a very foreign thought to them. On Saturday, there's two talks about forgiving others, which is even more foreign to them. During one of the Saturday talks, we're, we've asked them all day to uh, write down people's name they need to forgive or need to ask forgiveness from, and we do it as well. On my first weekend, I'm writing down all the usual suspects on my forgiveness list, my ex-wife, my kids, the people at work, my wife, my son, I mean, all the people that I needed to get forgiveness from, not forgive. I didn't think I had anybody to forgive. And about 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon, they remind us again to write down people's names. And my uncle's name came to my mind. I hadn't thought of him in years. And uh, he was a drunk. He was a thief. He was a drug addict. He mooched off my grandma and grandpa. He was a piece of crap, and I hated him. When I was 16, he tried to kill my mom. He stabbed her with a butcher knife and left her to die. And I swore I'd kill him if I ever got my hands on him. 
his name came to my mind that Saturday afternoon, and I wrote it on the paper, and I wrote it on the paper, and I wrote it on the paper until I tore the paper. And all that hate that I had for him came out on that paper. I got up, and I spoke to those guys sitting in that room, and I said, I'm sorry. Until about 45 seconds ago, you all were my uncle. And that's why I didn't want to be involved in a prison ministry. I didn't know why. I just knew I didn't. I told him a story about my mom. And afterwards, this guy walks up to me and he hugs me. And he said, I'm sorry to hear about your mom. I served time with your uncle. And I've heard that story. I said, well, I appreciate that. But he's been dead about 15 years. You probably didn't know him, but um, I appreciate it. And he said, I've been incarcerated for 30 years. I served time with your uncle, and I'm sorry about your mom. That's on Saturday afternoon. On Sunday afternoon, we have what's called a closing. It's the end of our weekend, and the inmates get to come up and share what their weekend's been like for them. And the chaplain of the prison comes up, and he gives a few words of encouragement and stuff. And uh, he got up there. He wasn't there the whole weekend. He knows nothing about what's going on that in my part, he gets up and he starts talking about he had 41 men that he had on the list to come to Kairos, and he needed one more. And he went and picked up a, a paper from one of the guys, and he said, this guy's cellmate wouldn't even look at me because I didn't think he deserved to go to Kairos, and I hadn't asked him, didn't give him any information on it. He said as he's walking out of that pod, he was praying, God, who else you want? I need one more person. And he said it was audible. He said, God said, bring me Noah. He turned around and went back to that cell, and he said, Marty, do you want to go to Kairos? And he said, Chaplain, you know I do. And he gave him the form. He filled it out. He came to Kairos. Marty Noah was the guy that knew my mom's brother. I know that God had me there to teach me about forgiveness. I know for a fact that God had Marty Noah there to teach me about forgiveness. I still don't like my uncle, but I've forgiven him. He's been dead for years. Uh, when he passed away, my mom called me. and She said, your Uncle Terry's dead. And I said, Mom, the only thing I regret is my hands weren't around his neck when he took his last breath. And she said, you ought to forgive him, I have. I said, I'll never forgive him. Well, on August, April the 6th, which was my mom's birthday of 06, I forgave him. I sat in prison, and I forgave him. That's what prison do, or Cairo's prison ministry has done for me. I promise if you get involved in this ministry, you'll see a miracle. I've done over 30 weekends. I've never left without seeing a miracle. If you believe when God changes someone's life, it's a miracle. I promise you a miracle. I promise you. Not everybody is cut out to go inside a prison, but everybody can be involved in this ministry. We need cookies. It says in the Bible that we're supposed to be fishers of men. Well, cookies are really good bait. We take in about 5,000 dozen cookies. 5,000 dozen. There's about 1,500 men in the, in the Hominy prison where we go, and uh, every man in the prison gets a dozen cookies on Friday and Saturday. All the staff get a dozen cookies on Friday and Saturday. And the 42 men and the, the 18 servants that come back get unlimited cookies on the weekend. We go through a bunch of cookies, but cookies are really good bait. We get to feed them their meals. We feed them dinner Thursday, lunch and dinner Friday, lunch and dinner Saturday, and lunch on Sunday. Each one of those meals are brought in from the outside. Um, I think Sean has some paperwork back there, uh, meal tickets. They're $10 a piece. You can donate $10, write your name on the, on the ticket, and put your first name and where, you're, where you worship, where you, where you live, whatever you're comfortable putting on there. And each meal, we lay these meal tickets by their plates and let them know that there's a human being that paid for that meal, a name that go with that meal. 
um, we do placemats. We have youth groups, Sunday school kids make placemats. Just no glitter, no glue, uh, just crayon or whatever, and, and just decorate a little placemat for them. We put that under their plates. Um, the funniest one we've ever seen was a little girl. She was five. I can't remember her name, but uh, she wrote on there, God will forgive you for what you've done. I know exactly what it's like to be in prison. I have to go to daycare. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that, I mean, those kind of things, those, most of the, the guys, when they get a placemat, they don't, they, they fold it up, they put it aside, they won't eat on it, they don't want to run it, and they take it back and they put it on the wall in their cell. Um, we give them letters. Anybody that wants to write letters, write 42 letters, love letters from God, uh, addressed to dear brother, dear sister in Christ. Um, they get a letter from each one of the team members in a sack on, on Saturday afternoon, and most of them, most of, don't get any mail at all, and none of them get any mail that's never been opened. Everything goes through the prison, goes through the mail room, gets opened, gets read, and then they get it already opened. We take our stuff into the mail room, they go through our stuff, we get them back on Friday night, and we get to stuff them in the envelope and, and seal it. And uh, so they get sealed letters. Opening an envelope seems like a waste of time to us. And they, they think it's great. They get to open the envelope. They think they're getting something that's personal for them. And they are, but um, it, it's not been opened, it, it, so they get it. Um, one of the guys at Harmony at the closing a few years ago, he said he got those letters and he read the first three, God loves you. He said, I knew they was going to say that. God loves you. I knew they was going to say that. God loves you. I knew they was going to say that. He stuck them back in the sack, took them back to his house, put them up, and didn't look at them for 13 years. One day he was having a really bad day, and he said he saw that bag of letters, and he got them down and was reading through them. Sure enough, God loves you. God loves you. And the very last one he pulled out of the bag was written by a little kid. He said, I could tell by the way the handwriting was. It was a small child, young. Read it. Got, back, got down to the bottom of it. Said, God loves you. He said, they brainwashed this poor kid. He turned it over, and it was signed by Hope, aged nine. And he started crying. He said, I think I always knew God loved me. I just needed hope. And so... Those, that bag of letters, 13 years later, changed his life. And now he's very active in Kairos at Hominy. Um, he's a great evangelist inside the prison right now. So the stories like that are endless. I, I can go on and on and on. I, I won't because they asked me to stay to 10 minutes. But, um, <laughs> but uh, if you're interested in getting involved, we'll be out there after, after the service. And uh, if you want any more information or whatever, let us know. We'd, we'd love for you to be involved. Thank you.